English major coach. I am Professor Paul Hiranyo, a faculty member of the University of San Agustin in Iloilo City. I was a part-time professor of English at St. Paul University, Iloilo. I taught for almost 10 years at Assumption, Iloilo. I finished my bachelor's degree in secondary education, major in English at West Visaya State University College of Education. And I have a master's degree in education, major in English as a second language from the University of the Philippines. And I'm currently finishing my Juris Doctor degree at the College of Law of the University of San Agustin. I have been teaching for 19 years and I have been a le lecturer for 10 years. Let's start. Okay, shall we? Okay, question number one. It is using sounds expressions or structures from the L1, that's first language, when performing in the L2 or second language. A, transfer. B, interlanguage. C, morphophonemic analysis. D, overgeneralization. Again, it is using sounds, expressions, or structures from the L1 when performing in the L2. A, transfer. B, interlanguage. C, morphophonemic analysis. D, overgeneralization. Okay, the correct answer is transfer or language transfer. It is using sounds, expressions, or structures from the L1 or first language when performing in the L2 or second language, we call it transfer. Language transfer is when you apply the features or rules of your first language to your second language. Again, language transfer is when you apply the rules or features of your first language or your native language to your second language. Example, you speak English with a Cebuano or Tagalog accent. We call that language transfer. You apply the accent of your first language into your second language, right? We call that transfer. Language transfer is the application of linguistic features from one language to another by a bilingual or multilingual speaker. Okay, language transfer. Speakers or writers applying knowledge from their native language to a second language or foreign language. It occurs in any situation when someone does not have a native level command. That is the concept of language transfer. Now let's go to question number two. Which Titan was the goddess of memory and mother of the muses? A. Themis. B. Mnemosyne. C. Tethys. D. Hera. Again, which Titan was the goddess of memory and mother of the muses? A. Themis. B. Mnemosyne. C. Tethys. D. Hera. Okay, the correct answer is letter B, Mimosini. Mimosini. Even Native American speakers have a problem as far as its pronunciation is concerned. Some Americans pronounce it Mimosine, but it's Mimosini. 
ni nemo si in greek mythology the goddess of memory nemo si she was the daughter of uranus or heaven and gaia or earth nemo si the greek goddess of memory She's pictured here in Rossetti's painting with a lamp of memory. She represented the road memorization required before the introduction of writing to preserve the stories of history and sagas of mythology. We get the concept of mnemonics. We have this word in English, mnemonics or mnemonic device. A word or a phrase or anything that we use to help us remember something, right? Mnemonics. Mnemosyne, the Greek goddess of memory. She's here. Okay, now let's go to question number three. Across the town from her wedding, the bank robbers were tying up the hostages. What literary device is at work here? A. Onomatopoeia. B. Metonymy. C. Juxtaposition. D. Hyperbole. Again, across the town from her wedding, the bank robbers were tying up the hostages. What literary device is at work here? A. Onomatopoeia. B. Metonymy. C. Juxtaposition. D. Hyperbole. Okay, the correct answer is letter C, juxtaposition. Juxtaposition is a literary device, or it is a literary concept that implies comparison or contrast. Writers create juxtaposition by playing, by placing rather, two entities side by side to create dramatic or ironic contrast so in the question here across the town from her wedding the bank robbers were tying up the hostages we have two events side by side wedding which is a happy event and robbery which is a tragic event or an unfortunate event one is positive the other one is negative so juxtaposition it is a literary concept that implies comparison or contrast. Writers create juxtaposition by placing two entities side by side, you know, wedding and bank cost, bank robbery, to create dramatic or ironic contrast. Juxtaposition is a literary device in which two or more ideas Places or characters are placed side by side to, to contrast each other. Essentially, juxtaposition is when two ideas, places, or characters are complete opposites of each other. Now let's get to question number four. Which of the following is not true of free verse? A, characterized by short, irregular lines. B, no rhyme pattern. C, written in iambic pentameter. Not a D, a dependence on the effective and more intense use of pauses. Again, which of the following is not true of free verse? A, characterized by short, irregular lines. B, no rhyme pattern. C, written in iambic Pentameter, Maridi, a dependence on the effective and more intense use of pauses. Okay, the correct answer is letter C, written in iambic pentameter. Which of the following is not true of reverse? It is written in iambic pentameter. When you say free verse, it is an open form of poetry, 
no meter patterns, no rhymes. So not true, that is still written in iambic pentameter because no rhyme, no meter pattern. When you see iambic pentameter, it is a metrical foot in poetry. Three verse poetry is a poem that is written without a regular rhyme scheme, meter, or form. Poets use free verse poetry because they want to use the natural rhythm of ordinary language to emphasize the simple beauty of everyday speech. The father of free verse is Walt Whitman. Again, the father of free verse is Walt Whitman. Whitman. Now let's go to question number five. What is the pen name of Nick Joaquin? A. Jogging Lion. B. Quijano de Manila. C. Laong Laan. Larry D. Fry Butod. Okay, the correct answer is Quijano de Manila. What is the pen name of Nick Joaquin Quijano de Manila. Nick Joaquin was a Filipino novelist, poet, playwright, essayist, and biographer whose works present the diverse heritage of the Filipino people. Starting as a proofreader for the Philippine Free Press, Joaquin rose to contributing editor and essayist, or essayist, under the nom diploma Quijano de Manila, which means Manila Old Timer. He was well known as a historian of the brief golden age of Spain in the Philippines, as the writer of short stories suffused with folk Roman Catholicism. As a playwright and as a novelist, Joaquin wrote his works in English. He was a Filipino writer in English. Now let's go to question number six. Which of the following best describes the primary purpose and function of classroom reading assessment? A to guide instructional planning and reading by determining individual students' ongoing reading needs. B, to prepare students for state standardized testing and reading by equipping them with a variety of test-taking strategies. Letter C, to monitor students' academic achievement in reading by measuring their mastery of the state reading standards. Larry B to evaluate the effectiveness of reading instruction by comparing the reading achievement of specific groups of students. Again, which of the following best describes the primary purpose and function of classroom reading assessment? Classroom reading assessment. Primary purpose and function. A, to guide instructional planning and reading by determining individual students' ongoing reading needs. Let it be to prepare students for state standardized testing and reading by equipping them with a variety of test-taking strategies. Let it see to monitor students' academic achievement in reading by measuring their mastery of the state reading standards. Let it be to evaluate the effectiveness of reading instruction by comparing the reading achievement of specific groups of students. Okay, the correct answer is letter A, to guide instructional planning in reading by determining individual students' ongoing reading needs. To guide instructional planning in reading. That is the primary purpose and function of the classroom reading assessment. In a standards-based curriculum, 
student performance standards inform assessment, which in turn informs instructional planning and practices. Reading teachers engage in classroom assessment on an ongoing basis to determine students' specific reading strengths and needs in order to plan reading instruction that is effective in promoting students' achievement of grade level performance standards. Now let's go to question number seven. A new story is said to possess timeliness if it A stresses events that have occurred in the last month, letter B stresses events that occurred today or yesterday, letter C has been written within the last six hours, letter D has been read or heard within the last six hours. Again, a new story is said to possess timeliness if it A stresses events that have occurred in the last month, letter B, stresses events that occurred today or yesterday, letter C, has been written within the last six hours, and letter D, has been read or heard within the last six hours. New story, timeliness. Okay, the correct answer is letter B, stresses events that occurred today or yesterday. Timeliness is one of the news elements or news values. What makes news news, right? Or what makes certain situations, certain events, certain happenings newsworthy? Timeliness, events that have just happened are current, ongoing, or about to happen are newsworthy. An earth, for example, an earthquake that happened an hour ago is more newsworthy than the earthquake that happened last week. Stresses events that occurred today or yesterday. So these are the seven news values. But other books give more. Timeliness, impact, proximity, prominence, relevance, oddity, conflict. Timeliness, recent events have higher use value than earlier happenings. Of particular value are stories brought to the public ahead of the competition. These are known as scoops timeliness or immediacy. The other term for timeliness is immediacy. Question number eight. In 1933, his footnote to youth, Tales of the Philippines and Others became the first book of fiction by a Filipino author published by a major United States-based press. A. Jose Garcia Villa. B. Carlos Bulosan, C. Arturo Rotor, Larry B. Carlos P. Romano. Again, in 1933, his footnote to youth, Tales of the Philippines and Others, became the first book of fiction by a Filipino author published by a major United States-based press. A. Jose Garcia Villa, B. Carlos Bulosan, C. Arturo Rotor. Larry D. Carlos P. Romulo. Okay, the correct answer is letter A, Jose Garcia Villa. Jose Garcia Villa was a Filipino poet, writer, and critic. He used the name, the pen name, Dobig Lion. I'm not sure about the pronunciation. It's Dog Lion, Dog, Dog Lion, which was a combination of dog, eagle, and lion. Dog Lion. And was what he believed was his true persona. 
according to him, he, he believed that he was a combination of a dove, an eagle, and a lion. That's why he used the pen name David Lion, Jose Garcia Villa. Jose Garcia Dilia was a Filipino literary critic, poet, painter, and short story writer who was born on August 5, 1908 in Manila. He gained both local and international recognition for his works. He was named as a National Artist for Literature in 1973, and he was also a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship. During his college years, he wrote Man Songs, a collection of controversial poems that was considered too bold at the University of the Philippines and became the ground for his suspension from the said institution. Some of his well-known literary works are Miranisa, won in the Philippines Free Press in 1929, and Footnote to You, my personal favorite, published in 1933. Footnote to Youth is a very popular short story written by Jose Garcia Villa, which talks about the story of Dodong and Tiang. Dodong, who thought at a young age he was already a man and was ready to start a family. Jose Garcia Villa's short story, Footnote to Youth. Number nine, it involves the accurate use of words and structures. A, communicative competence. That would be strategic competence. C, grammatical competence. D, discourse competence. Again, it involves the accurate use of words and structures. A, communicative competence. B, strategic competence. Let us see, grammatical competence. Let it be discourse competence. Okay, the correct answer is letter C, grammatical competence. It involves the accurate use of words and structures, grammatical competence. Sometimes it is called linguistic competence. Grammatical competence is your knowledge, your grammatical competence is your knowledge of grammar, lexis, morphology, syntax, semantics, and morphology. Grammatical competence is the ability to understand and express meaning by producing and recognizing well-formed phrases and sentences. Aside from grammatical competence, we also have strategic competence, social linguistic competence, and um, discourse competence. Number 10. Which of the following best describes the role of phonics in a research-based elementary school reading program? A phonics is an instructional strategy that should be used primarily as an intervention with students who are experiencing reading difficulties. B phonics is a key component of comprehensive reading instruction that supports students' development of fluency and comprehension. C phonics is a reading technique that should be taught implicitly to students who demonstrate specific needs in the area of decoding skills. And letter B, phonics is the central focus of reading instruction until students have achieved automatic recognition of high frequency sight words. Again, which of the following best describes the role of phonics in a research-based elementary school reading program? Okay, the correct answer is letter B, phonics is a key component of comprehensive reading instruction that supports 
students' development of fluency and comprehension. It's letter B. Rapid automatic word recognition plays an important role in both reading fluency and comprehension. Research indicates that most children who are struggling readers lack mastery of fundamental phonological aspects of reading. Decoding, including applying knowledge and skills in phonics, syllabication, and morphology, is the primary strategy effective readers use to identify words they cannot recognize immediately. Let's go to number 11. This Filipino writer, in English, spent most of his life in the United States. His best known work today is the semi autobiographical of America is in the Heart. A. Leon Chopi de Riada. B. F. Chanel Jose. C. Serino F. Bautista. D. Carlos S. Bolusan. Again, this Filipino writer in English spent most of his life in the United States. His best known work today is the semi or semi-autobiographical America is in the heart. A. Leon Chopi Triada. B. F. Chanel Jose. C. Serino F. Bautista. D. Carlo, Carlos S. Bulosan. Okay, the correct answer is letter D. Carlos S. Bulosan. He spent most of his life in the United States and his best known work today is America is in the Heart. Carlos S. Bulosan. Leon Chopi de Riada is very special to me because he was my professor in creative writing in UP. Um, Dr. de Riada is a Hall of Fame awardee of the Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards for Literature. Okay, Carlos Bulosan no? was an English language Filipino novelist and poet. He immigrated to the United States on July 1, 1930. He never returned to the Philippines and he spent most of his life there in the U.S. That's why the title of his famous work is America is in the Heart. A chronicler of the Filipino American experience during the 1930s to the early 1950s, he is best remembered for his semi fictional semi-autobiographical novel, America is in the Heart, 1946, a staple in American ethnic studies and Asian American studies classes. That's Carlos Bolosan. Bolosan's works describe the experience of growing up poor in a rural area of the Philippines, chronicling social and economic conditions created by the American occupation and centuries of Spanish colonialism. One of the works of one of the short stories of Carlos Bolosan was the subject of my undergraduate thesis. The title of the short story is As Long as the Grass Shall Grow. So I'm very familiar with Bolosan. Carlos S. Sampayan Bolosan. Bolosan's work captures the push factors that drove his generation to the U.S. During that time, there was a mass migration of Filipinos to the U.S., especially to Hawaii and 
and Guam, right? Like Bulosan, they hope to find a better future and forge resilient and adaptive communities in the face of an often hostile and exploitative European American culture in the United States. So this is Carlos S. Bulosan. Now let's go to question number 12. Journalists recognized two types of news stories, hard news and soft news. In this regard, A, hard news is about complicated topics like science and economics, and soft news is about things like entertainment and fashion. B, hard news stories have long, complicated sentences, and soft news stories have short, simple sentences. Let us see, hard news is about serious topics and recent events, and soft news refers to human interest stories. And letter D, hard news stories are always 2,000 words or more, and soft news stories never exceed 500 words. Again, journalists recognize two types of news stories, hard news and soft news. In this regard, A, hard news is about complicated topics like science and economics, and soft news is about things like entertainment and fashion. Letter B, hard news stories have long, complicated sentences, and soft news stories have short, simple sentences. Letter C, hard news is about serious topics and recent events, and soft news refers to human interest stories. Letter D, hard news stories are always 2,000 words or more, and soft news stories never exceed 500 words. Okay, the correct answer is letter C. Hard news is about serious topics and recent events. And soft news refers to human interest stories. So it's hard news versus soft news. When you say hard news, these are topics that are timely. Reason, it says letter C, recent events, timely, important, and consequential. Important topics and consequential topics. So we have here serious topics, so letter C, such as politics, international affairs, and business news. On the other hand, soft news includes such topics as entertainment, celebrity, and lifestyle news. That's why refers, let us see, soft news refers to human interest stories, entertainment, celebrities, and lifestyle news. Light topics. So we have here a comparison. Hard news versus soft news. Hard news, this type of news is up to the minute news that and events that are reported immediately after they have taken place. Subject matter, maybe, maybe economics, politics, war and crime. It refers to news which is usually very serious, perhaps urgent, factual and formal tone of presentation. So we have formal mode of address. Now, soft news, this type of news is intended to entertain or inform the reader and refers to stories that are usually of human interest. Subject material may be celebrity, gossip, fashion tips, technology, and humorous and feel-good stories. It is not time-sensitive. So, informal mode of address. Okay, question number 13. Which goddess was obliged to spend part of every year in the underworld because Hades tricked her into eating pomegranate seeds? A. Calliope. B. Demeter. C. Aphrodite. D. Persephone. Again, which goddess 
was obliged to spend part of every year in the underworld because Hades tricked her into eating pomegranate seeds. A. Calliope. B. Demeter. C. Aphrodite. D. Persephone. Okay, the correct answer is Persephone. Which goddess was obliged to spend part of every year in the other world? Because Hades tricked her into eating pomegranate seeds. It's Persephone. Pomegranate is a fruit-bearing shrub. The healing powers of pomegranates have been championed for centuries. High in antioxidants and vitamin C. The pomegranate fruit has been used for thousands of years as medicine. So Persephone is the goddess of seasonal change and vegetation, particularly grain. She's the daughter of Demeter. Let's talk about the story of Hades and Persephone. This is the pomegranate fruit. In ancient Greek religion and mythology, Persephone was the daughter of Zeus, the chief god, and Demeter, the goddess of agriculture. By the way, Demeter is Ceres in Roman mythology. Against her will, she became the wife of Hades, the god of the underworld, which was the underground realm of the dead. The Romans called her Proserpine. Persephone was said to have been gathering flowers in a meadow when Hades abducted her or kidnapped her. In some versions of the myth, Zeus had given Hades permission to marry her. Demeter, on the other hand, was overcome with grief over the loss of her daughter to the shadowy kingdom of the dead. She would not allow any crops to grow, remember? She's the goddess of agriculture. So she, wouldn't, she was very sad because her daughter was kidnapped, so she would not allow any crops to grow while her daughter was gone. To prevent human beings from starving to death, Zeus eventually ordered Hades to return Persephone to Demeter. Hades had given Persephone a pomegranate seed to eat. However, and anyone who ate food in the underworld remained connected to it. For this reason, Persephone had to live with him as queen of the underworld for a third of each year, a part of the year. She returned to her mother for the remaining two-thirds of the year. So two-thirds of the year, Persephone would spend it with her mother. And another and, and one-third of the year, she spent this with Hades in the underworld. This myth accounts for the change of the seasons and the annual cycle of the growth and decay of vegetation. The months Persephone spent underground each year would have been the winter, and her return to Demeter would have been in spring. So this explains the changing of the seasons. If it's winter, it means that Persephone is down there in the underworld with the husband Hades. If it's spring, it means that Persephone is with her mother. In, in Greece, in Mount Olympus. Now let's go to question number 14. It is a story whose sole purpose is to represent an abstract concept or idea, a anecdote, the allegory, the allusion, the aphorism. Again, it is a story whose sole purpose is to represent an abstract concept or idea, a anecdote, the allegory, the allusion, the aphorism. 
Okay, the correct answer is allusion. A story whose sole purpose is to represent an abstract concept or idea. Allusion. An allusion is a reference or mention of a person, event, statement, piece of art, history, myth, religion, or popular culture. The reference is usually indirect within the writing. Indirect. It means not direct, right? Within the writing. Since the person, place, or thing is not mentioned directly, it is assumed that the reader already has knowledge of what is being referenced. I will give you examples of allusion. For example, here she acts like Scrooge with her money and will not buy anything if she does not need it. Again, she acts like Scrooge with her money and will not buy anything if she does not need. So Scrooge is mentioned here. Who is Scrooge, right? This is an allusion to a character in Charles Dickens' novel, A Christmas Carol. The name of the character is Ebenezer Scrooge, right? Scrooge in the novel is an old man who hates spending money. So now when you say Scrooge, it means somebody who does not want to spend his money. And this is viewed negatively or a miserly person. So Ebenezer Scrooge. She acts like Scrooge with her money and will not buy anything if she does not need it. Another example, I met a man who was romantic and a true Romeo. I met a man who was romantic. And the true Romeo, of course, you know, in literature, you know who Romeo is, right? The lover of Julian in Romeo, in William Shakespeare's tragedy, Romeo in Julian. It means a great lover, Romeo. He is the Romeo of the class. It means this boy or this man is a great lover. Now let's go to number 15. It is the ability to organize a message effectively and to compensate via strategies for any difficulties. A, communicative competence. B, strategic competence. C, grammatical competence. D, social linguistic competence. Again, it is the ability to organize a message effectively and to compensate via strategies for any difficulties. A, communicative competence. B, strategic competence. C, grammatical competence. Letter D, social linguistic competence. Okay, the correct answer is strategic competence. The ability to organize a message effectively and to compensate via strategies for any difficulties. Remember, we have around four. We have strategic... These are um, the subdivisions of communicative competence, strategic competence, discourse competence, social linguistic competence, and grammatical or linguistic competence. So strategic competence is the ability to organize a message effectively and to compensate via strategies for any difficulties. You have strategic competence if you know how to overcome difficulties when communication breakdown happens. When something bad happens during a communication process, you know how to deal with it, right? For example, you forget, you forget a line in your speech. If you know how to deal with this, then you have strategic competence. Strategic competence is knowing how to recognize and repair communication breakdowns, learn more about the language in the context, overcome misunderstandings and gaps in language skills by employing paraphrases, analogies, explanations, 
and nonverbal communication. If it's difficult for you to understand or if it's difficult for you to send your message um, orally or verbally, then you use nonverbal strategies, right? That is strategic competence. Strategic competence asks, how do I know when I have misunderstood or when someone has misunderstood me? What do I say then? How can I express my ideas if I don't know the name of something of the right verb form or the right verb form to use? Strategic competence. Now let's go to number 16. He was a fictionist, essayist, poet, and teacher who articulated the Filipino spirit in rural, urban landscapes. He won the first Commonwealth Literary Contest in 1940, received the Republic Cultural Heritage Award in 1960, and the Gawad CCP, the Cultural Center of the Philippines, para sa sining in 1990, A. Augusto Catanjal, B. Manuel Argilia, C. Bienvenido Santos, D. M. B. M. Gonzalez. Again, he was a fictionist, essayist, poet, and teacher who articulated the Filipino spirit in rural, urban landscapes. He won the first Commonwealth Literary Contest in 1940, received the Republic Cultural Heritage Award in 1960, and the Gawad CCP, Para Sa Sining, in 1990. A. Agosto Catanjal, B. Manuel Argilia, C. Bienvenido Santos, D. N. B. M. Gonzalez. Okay, the correct answer is NBM Gonzalez. Nestor Vicente Madali Gonzalez, commonly known as NBM Gonzalez, was born on September 8, 1915, in Roblon, Philippines, the marble capital of the Philippines, and died on November 28, 1999. His mother was a teacher and his father was a school supervisor. He was a fictionist, essayist, poet, and teacher who articulated the Filipino spirit in rural and urban landscapes. So this is NVM Gonzalez, National Artist for Literature. Now let's go to number 17, public or civic journalism is a movement that says, A, Journalists should do what they can to support broad involvement in public affairs. B, the best journalism is that which focuses exclusively on public affairs and ignores such things as sports and entertainment. C, journalists should reveal every step they take in the reporting process to regain public confidence. And letter D, journalists should provide only the news the public wants to read or hear. Again, public or civic journalism is a movement that says, A, journalists should do what they can to support broad involvement in public affairs. B, the best journalism is that which focuses exclusively on public affairs and ignores such things as sports and entertainment. Letter C, journalists should reveal every step they take in the reporting process to regain public confidence. And letter D, journalists should provide only the news the public wants to read or hear. Okay, the correct answer is letter A. Journalists should do what they can to support broad involvement in public affairs. Public or civic journalism is a movement that says Journalists should do what they can to teach broad involvement in public affairs. I think I have to correct what is in the question, in your test question. It says there's civil journalism. It should be civic journalism. Public or civic journalism is a movement that says journalists should do what they can to support broad involvement in public affairs. Civic journalism is the idea of integrating journalism into the democratic 
process, a broad involvement in public affairs. The media not only informs the public, but it also works towards engaging citizens, creating public debate. The civic journalism movement is an attempt to abandon the notion that journalists and their audiences are spectators in political and social processes. In its place, the civic journalism movement seeks to treat readers and community members as participants. Now let's go to question number 18. A kindergarten teacher orally presents students with pairs of words like buy and tie, see and saw, and has students identify whether the words rhyme or not. Next, she says a series of one-syllable words and asks students to point to a part of the body that rhymes with each word. For example, the teacher says bed and students point to their head, right? These activities promote students' reading development primarily by A, improving their word decoding skills, B, expanding their understanding of the alphabetic principle, C, enriching their vocabulary knowledge, or B, promoting their development of phonological awareness. Again, a kindergarten teacher orally presents students with pairs of words, for example, by and tie see and saw, and has students identify whether the words rhyme or not. Next, she says a series of one-syllable words and asks students to point to a part of the body that rhymes with each word. For example, the teacher says bed and students point to their head. These activities promote students' reading development primarily by A, improving their word decoding skills, B, expanding the understanding of the alphabetic principle. Let us see, enriching their vocabulary knowledge. Let us be promoting the development of phonological awareness. Okay, the correct answer is let us be promoting their development of phonological awareness. Young children are used to attending to oral language solely for meaning. Since the English writing system is alphabetic and English spellings reflect both graphophonemic and morphophonemic relationships, young children also need to begin to develop the awareness that oral language comprises sounds. So phonological awareness. Helping children learn to identify words that rhyme is one important component of developing students' phonological awareness skills. Okay, using a finite set of rules can produce innumerable grammatical utterances. What do you call this property of language? A, duality of structure. B, recursiveness. C, displacement. That is the transference. Again, using a finite set of rules, a speaker can produce innumerable grammatical utterances. What do you call this property of language? A, duality of structure. B, recursiveness. C, displacement. D, transference. Okay, the correct answer is recursiveness. A speaker can produce innumerable grammatical utterances. Recursiveness. When you say recursion, recursiveness, recursion, recursion is a property of language. By its definition, recursion is the repetition of something. Repetition of something. So produce innumerable grammatical utterances. In language, things can be repeated almost infinitely. We all know that language uses finite means to get infinite number of sentences. 
We create sentences almost freely. Sometimes they don't make sense. True, but they still remain a possibility. So here, I am very tired. If I feel extremely tired, I might put another very in front of very tired as a free modification instead of using the adverb phrase extremely. Instead of saying, I am extremely tired, we put another very in front of very tired. So we say, I am very, very tired. This is an example of recursion, repetition of something, and that is a property of language. In language, again, things can be repeated almost infin infinitely. Grammatically, this is allowed even 100 times. Even if you say, I am very, 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 very tired, that is allowed. So the sentence, I am very, 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 very tired, is perfectly grammatical. Although it is not used simply because it's not economical or practical. It takes up a lot of space. This is the example of recursion, the repetition of the adverb or adverb phrase very. Now let's go to question number 20. Bias is most likely to appear in a news story when A, the reporter relies on multiple sources and gives abundant time or space to all sides of a controversy. B, the reporter's story is reviewed by a large number of editors and supervisors. Letter C, the reporter is writing about a topic that he or she already knows a lot about. And letter D, the reporter is writing about people he or she has known for some time. Letter E, the reporter relies on one source or gives disproportionate time to space to one side of a controversy. Again, bias or media bias or journalistic bias is most likely to appear. In a news story when A, the reporter relies on multiple sources and gives abundant time or space to all sides of a controversy. Letter B, the reporter's story is reviewed by a large number of editors and supervisors. Letter C, the reporter is writing about a topic that he or she already knows a lot about. Letter D, the reporter is writing about people he or she has known for some time. In letter E, the reporter relies on one source or gives disproportionate time to space to one time or space to one side of a controversy. Media bias. Correct answer is letter E. Bias is most likely to appear in a news story when the reporter relies on one source or gives disproportionate time or space to one side of a controversy. Controversy. So media bias or bias happens in the selection of many events and stories and how they are reported or covered. The opposite here is media neutrality. Media bias is the inability of the journalist to report all available stories and facts. Okay, it says here you only rely on one source or give disproportionate time or space to one side of a controversy. It happens if the journalist has failed to report all available stories and facts. It means you, you, you fail to report all sides of the story. That is media bias. Okay, now let's go to number 21. The theory which is based on the assumption that language originated as a result of human instinct to imitate sounds. A, Bing Dong theory. B, Bow Wow theory. C, Poo Poo 
theory, the gesture theory. Again, the theory which is based on the assumption that language originated as a result of human instinct to imitate sounds. A, ding dong theory. B, bow wow theory. C, poo poo theory. Letter D, gesture theory. Okay, the correct answer is letter B, bow wow theory. The theory which is based on the assumption that language originated as a result of human instinct to imitate sounds, to copy sounds. Bow wow theory states that humans started out mimicking the noises and animal calls around them. From these noises, words developed. That's the bow wow theory of the origin of language. So I have given here the four theories of the origin of language. There are, there are more. The bow wow theory, which states that human speech originated in man's attempt to imitate the sounds of nature. That's the bow wow theory. The ding dong theory, correspondence between sound and sense, be a law of nature, a mysterious law of harmony that everything that is struck rings and rings in a peculiar way. Next, we have the poo-poo theory. The origin of language in involuntary exclamations sounds. And the gesture theory, language originates in gesture or a human movement. So the Bowel theory states that humans started out mimicking the noises and animal calls around them. And from these noises, words develop. The Bowel theory of the origin of language. Now let's go to number 22. Why was Arachne transformed into a spider? This is a question. Um, on Greek mythology. Why was Arachne transformed, transformed into a spider? A, Hera got mad because Zeus seduced her. Letter B, she pridefully challenged Athena to a weaving contest. Letter C, she refused Apollo's amorous advances. And letter D, she stole the loom of one of the three fates. Again, why was Arachne transformed into a spider. A, Hera got mad because Zeus seduced her. Letter B, she pridefully challenged Athena to a weaving contest. Letter C, she refused Apollo's amorous advances. And letter D, she stole the loom of one of the three fates. Okay, the correct answer is letter B. She pridefully challenged Athena to a weaving contest. That's why she was transformed into a spider. Arachne is a character in Greek mythology. She was the daughter of Edmond of Colophon in Lydia, which was part of Greece. Her father earned his living with dyeing cloth, putting color, right? into the textile. She learned to be a weaver as well. A weaver makes cloth or textiles from single strands. And she was a famous weaver in her town, in Lydia, right? Arachne was good at weaving and that she claimed that her skill was greater than that of Athena. Athena was the young Greek goddess of weaving, amongst other things, right? Athena appeared to the girl as an old woman and warned her not to offend the gods. 
because she said that because Arachne said that her skill was better than that of Athena's weaving skill. So Athena warned her not to offend the gods. Arachne did not take the advice. She wanted a weaving contest to prove her skill. She told Athena, I'm challenging you to a weaving contest. Athena revealed herself and let the contest begin. Athena wove her scene where she won over Poseidon, the god of the sea. Arachne wove scenes about Zeus being unfaithful with different women, Lida, Europa, and Dane. Athena saw Arachne's work was without error. It was perfect, but she did not like the subject of Arachne's weaving, which was the, the women in the life of Zeus. Athena lost her temper. She got mad and destroyed what Arachne had created. She also hit Arachne on the head. Arachne then realized what she had done. She ran away and killed herself. Athena, however, had pity with Arachne. So before Arachne was dead, she changed the rope into a cobweb and Arachne into a spider. Now let's go to number 23. It refers to a poem or story that is directly inspired by another piece of art. A. Amanuensis. B. Palindrome. C. Limerick. D. Ekphrasis. Again, it refers to a poem or story that is directly inspired by another piece of art. A. Amanuensis. B. Palindrome. C. Limerick. D. Ekphrasis. Okay, the correct answer is letter D, Ekphrasis, a poem or story that is directly inspired by another piece of art. If you see a beautiful painting and you write a poem about that painting, that is Ekphrasis. Ekphrasis is a novel, a story, or a poem based on a work of art. For example, is Edwin Markham's poem inspired by Jean-Francois Millet's painting, Man with a Hoe. So this is the painting, Man with a Hoe, by Jean-Francois Millet. And this inspired Edwin Markham to write a famous poem of the same title. Now let's go to question number 24. A teacher observes that some students in the class seem indifferent to reading and rarely choose to read voluntarily. Which of the following approaches to addressing this situation is likely to be most effective in cultivating these students' enthusiasm for reading? A, explaining to the students the benefits of reading and scheduling time each week for the students to spend in the school library, B, providing the students with explicit instruction and comprehension strategies that apply to reading specific types of content area texts, letter C, challenging the students to read a certain number of books per month and displaying each student's progress on a classroom wall chart. And letter D, involving students in author studies in which they read a number of books by the same author and discuss the books in small groups. Again, a teacher observes that some students in the class seem indifferent to reading and rarely choose to read voluntarily. Which of the following approaches to addressing this situation is likely to be most effective in cultivating these students' enthusiasm for reading. A, 
explaining to the students the benefits of reading and scheduling time each week for the students to spend in the school library. B, providing the students with explicit instruction in comprehension strategies that apply to reading specific types of content area texts. Letter C, challenging the students to read a certain number of books per month and displaying each student's progress on a classroom wall chart. And letter D, involving students in author studies in which they read a number of books by the same author and discuss the books in small groups. Okay, the correct answer is letter D, involving students in author studies in which they read a number of books by the same author and discuss the books in small groups. Avid readers frequently select new books to read independently by actively seeking out books written by favorite authors. Students who rarely read independently, however, do not tend to have favorite authors, nor are they likely to be familiar with the body of work specific authors have developed. An important component of promoting reluctant readers' independent reading is helping them discover authors whose writing they enjoy and promoting their awareness that authors often have a whole body of work that shares similar features and style. So that is a good strategy. Author studies contribute directly to the achievement of these goals. Now let's go to number 25. When it comes to writing about rape cases, the practice of most news organizations is to refuse to a, identify the suspected rapist. B, identify the rape victim. C, identify the rape victim and the suspected rapist. And letter D, publish any information about the crime. Again, when it comes to writing about rape cases, the practice of most news organizations is to refuse to A, identify the suspected rapist. B, identify the rape victim. Letter C, identify the rape victim and the suspected rapist. And letter D, publish any information about the crime. Okay, the correct answer is letter B, identify the rape victim. When it comes to writing about rape cases, the practice of most news organizations is to refuse to identify the rape victim. Much has been written about whether victims of rape or sexual assault should be named given the high-profile nature of the crime. The general belief is that given the stigma sexual assault carries in most societies, media should refrain from identifying victims of most sexual crimes unless the victim is willing to speak publicly. Do not name the victim of rape or sexual assault. Many believe it is more important to report their relationship with the accused and what happened rather than the names, as long as these details don't specifically identify the person. The cases should then be covered to the end. It refers to the linguistic norm specific to a geographical area, social class, or status affecting mutual intelligibility. A. Dialect. B. Idiolect. C. Register. D. Slam. Again, it refers to the linguistic norm specific to a geographical area social class or status affecting mutual intelligibility a dialect b idiolect c register d slam okay the correct answer is dialect 
the linguistic norm specific to a geographical area, social class, or status, affecting mutual intelligibility, dialect. Dialect is a form of a language that people speak in a particular part of a country, containing some different words and grammar, etc. For example, in the U.S., of course we know that they speak English there in the U.S. Yes, English is spoken there, no doubt. But the English in New York is a bit different from the English in California. We call that dialect, the different varieties of English. So we have several American English dialects. We have the Northern dialects, such as the English in New Hampshire. We have the Midland dialect, such as the English in Tennessee. The Southern dialect, such as the English in South Carolina, so on and so forth. We also have the Western dialect, uh, such as the English in California. Even us here in Western Visayas, we speak Ilongo, but the Ilongo in Iloilo is a little different from the Ilongo or from the Hiligaynon in Iloilo is a bit different from the Hiligaynon in Bacolo. But we understand each other. Probably a little difference in accent. Yeah. We, we, we can identify whether you are from Iloilo or you are from Bacolo. We call that dialect. Now let's go to number 27. Which of the following is not part of the Shannon and Weaver mathematical theory? This is the mathematical theory of communication. Mathematical because it's in a graphical form, right? A, source, B, transmitter, C, computation, B, channel, D, receiver. Again, which of the following is not part of the Shannon and Weaver mathematical theory? A, source, B, transmitter, C, computation, letter D, channel, and letter E, receiver. Okay, the correct answer is computation. That's letter C. Not part of the Shannon and Weaver mathematical theory of communication. The Shannon Weaver model has been called the mother of all communication models. Computation is not one of the elements in the Shannon Weaver model of communication. Social scientists use the term to refer to an integrated model of the concepts of information source, message, transmitter, signal, channel, noise, receiver, information destination, probability of error, encoding, decoding, information rate, and channel capacity. So computation is not mentioned here. Okay, number 28. Word reading is also called A, encoding, B, decoding, C, understanding, D, comprehension. Again, word reading is also called A, encoding, B, decoding, C, understanding, D, comprehension. Okay, the correct answer is decoding. When you read, you decode, decoding. Decoding is being able to use visual, syntactic, or semantic cues to make meaning from words and sentences. In simple terms, it is reading a text. Decoding. Now let's go to question number 29. It refers to an individual's equal and native command of two or more languages. A. Bilingualism. B. Polyglotism, C. Multilingualism, D. All of these, E. None of these. Again, it refers to an individual's equal and native command of two or more languages. A. Bilingualism, 
B, polyglotism. C, multilingualism. B, all of these. E, none of these. Okay, the correct answer is letter C, multilingualism. Okay. Individuals equal and native command of two or more languages. If you are proficient in only one language, then you are monolingual. If you are proficient in just two languages, you are bilingual. If you are proficient in two or more languages, you are multilingual. And a person who speaks a lot of languages is called a polyglot. Right? Multilingualism is the ability of an individual speaker or a community of speakers to communicate effectively in three or more, two, three or more languages. Multilingualism. Multilingualism is the act of using or promoting the use of multiple languages, either by an individual speaker or by a community of speakers. Multilingual speakers outnumber monolingual speakers in the world's population. Multilingualism is becoming a social phenomenon governed with the needs of globalization and cultural openness. So here are the advantages of multilingualism for personal and social benefit. It helps to gain recognition and status in the eyes of society. Cognitive and academic benefits. It helps to understand the reading process through multilingual interpretation in a better way. Multilingual proficiency increases one's prospect of higher education. And economic benefits. It enhances one's competitive skill and global perspective. So the advantages of multilingualism are personal and social benefits cognitive and academic benefits, and economic benefits. Now let's go to number 30. The process in which large media companies purchase smaller media companies is known as A, monopolization, B, economic convergence, C, consolidation, D, media convergence. Again, the process in which large media companies purchase smaller media companies is known as A, monopolization, B, economic convergence, C, consolidation, D, media convergence. Okay, the correct answer is consolidation. Consolidation is big media companies buying small media companies. Media consolidation is the concentration of ownership of news sources into the hands of fewer and fewer corporations. It is giant corporations own more and more of our news media. It's consolidation. Okay, now let's go to number 31. MVM Gonzalez's short story, Children of the Ash Covered Loam, is a depiction of A, his life as a child in a rural island province, B, his life as a battered child, C, his life as a Filipino child roaming the streets of Manila, letter D, his life as a refugee in Mindanao. Again, MVM Gonzalez's short story. Children of the Ash-Covered Loam is a depiction of A, his life as a child in a rural island province. B, his life as a battered child. C, his life as a Filipino child roaming the streets of Manila. And letter D, his life as a refugee in Mindanao. Okay, the correct answer is letter a, his life as a child in a rural island province. So, NB, NVM Gonzalez's short story, Children of the Ash Covered Loam, is a depiction of his life as a child in a rural island 
province. Children of the Ash Covered Low is a story of a boy named Tarang who wants to help his father. His parents work in a farm. The story is about the marginalized and poor rural folks and the children there who keep tilling the soil against all odds in order to survive one day at a time. So it's about the struggles of the farmers and the children in the farm who help their parents in order to survive life. So that is the story, Children of the Ash Covered Loan, written by N.B.M. Gonzalez. Now let's go to question number 32. The study of meaning is called A. Phonology, B. Morphology, C. Syntax, D. Semantics. Again, the study of meaning is called A. Phonology, B. Morphology, C. Syntax, the semantics. Okay, the correct answer is semantics. The study of meaning is called semantics. Semantics is the study of the relationship between words and how we draw meaning from those words. So the study of meaning is called semantics. Phonology is about the sound system of a language. Morphology is the formation of words, morphemes, syntax, the arrangement of words in a sentence. Semantics, the meaning of words or the meaning of sentences, phrases, and clauses. The noun semantics and the adjective semantic are derived from the Greek word semantikos, which means significant. In linguistics, semantics is the subfield that is devoted to the study of meaning as born on the syntactic levels of words, phrases, sentences, and sometimes larger units of discourse, generically referred to as texts. Now let's go to question number 33. In Greek mythology, she refused to marry anyone unless they could beat her in a foot race. A. Atalanta. B. Nausica. C. Penelope. D. Eurydice. Again, in Greek mythology, she refused to marry anyone unless they could beat her in a foot race. Okay, the correct answer is Atalanta. She refused to marry anyone unless they could beat her in a foot race. Atalanta. Atalanta was an Arcadian heroine, a huntress, and a favorite of the goddess Artemis. Artemis liked her so much because of her survival instinct, impressive skills, courage, and noble character. That's Atalanta. She refused to marry anyone unless they could beat her in a foot race. Now let's go to question number 34. Okay, number 34. Which of the following employs anaphora? It's pronounced anaphora, not anaphora. Anaphora. A, love is blind. B, the youth is the hope of the fatherland. C, all that glitters is not gold. Let it be bold, be brief, be gone. Again, which of the following employs anaphora? A, love is blind. B, the youth is the hope of the fatherland. C, all that glitters is not gold. Let it be bold, be brief, be gone. The correct answer is letter D, be bold, be brief, be gone. 
Anaphora is a rhetorical or literary device in which a word or expression is repeated. So be bold, be brief, be gone. At the beginning of a number of sentences, clauses, or phrases. So the word be here at the beginning is repeated three times. Be bold, be brief, be gone. So this is a figure of speech, a literary device, rather, called anaphora. Now let's go to number 35. Which of the following is not a part of media literacy? A, being able to read or understand content in different languages. B, critically analyzing media content by considering its particular presentation and its underlying political or social messages. Assessing media ownership and regulation issues it might affect what media is presented, in what form, and knowing how technology affects media. Again, which of the following is not part of media literacy? A, being able to read or understand content in different languages. B, critically analyzing media content by considering its particular presentation and its underlying political or social messages. Larry C, assessing media ownership and regulation issues that might affect what media is presented in what form. And letter D, knowing how technology affects media. Okay, the correct answer is being able to read or understand content in different languages, not a part of media literacy, being able to read or understand content in different languages. Media literacy, if you can access, critically evaluate, and create or manipulate media, that is media literacy. And media literacy is not about understanding messages in different languages. So letter A, not part of media literacy, being able to read or understand content in different languages. Letter B, critically analyzing media content, of course. It's media literacy. Let us see, assessing media ownership and regulation issues. You assess, you know, you evaluate. That is also media literacy. And knowing how technology affects media, that is media literacy as well. Again. Carlos Bolosan expressed in his short story, As Long As the Grass Shall Grow, his desire is to A, be educated so that he could get ahead in life. There is a correction there in your PDF. It's get ahead of life. It's get ahead in life, not of life. Please change the preposition from of to in. Again, be educated so that he could get ahead in life. B, go back to the Philippines to see his relatives again. Larry C. run for an elected post in his home province. And Larry D. take a PhD in literature in the United States. Again, Carlos Bolosan expressed in his short story, As Long as the Grass Shall Grow, his desire is to A. be educated so that he could get ahead in life. B. go back to the Philippines to see his relatives again. Larry C. run for an elected post in his home province. And letter D, take a PhD in literature in the United States. Okay, the correct answer is letter A, be educated so that he could get ahead in life. The opening of the story itself reveals his desire to be educated. It says there, in the middle of that year, when we were picking peas on the hillside, I noticed the school children playing with their teacher in the sun. Then he said, Then I saw the children. They reminded me of a vanished time. 
I used to stop at my work and watch them singing and running and screaming in the sun. One dark-haired boy in particular, about eight, brought back acute memories of a childhood friend who died a violent death. So, um, As Long As the Grass Shall Grow is a story of a Filipino who left the Philippines to find his fortune in the United States before the Second World War. Probably he left the Philippines because of poverty, so he wasn't able to go to school so back in the Philippines, right? When he was in the U.S., he would look at the school child, the school, he would look at the school children, rather, school kids, playing around during their spare time and rekindle his desire to be educated, okay? Now, let's go to number 37 in terms of including expository texts in your classroom library. Teachers should, A, introduce them as such to the students and emphasize that they are informational, not for enjoyment. B, introduce them as part of the classroom reading aloud routine. Letter C, set aside a time of day just for expository books. Letter D, use expository books in lieu of textbooks. What is the correct answer? Letter B, introduce them as part of the classroom read aloud routine. In terms of including expository text in your classroom library, teachers should introduce them as part of the classroom read aloud routine. There are many enjoyable informational trade books available. Let the children know. When you say expository texts or informational texts, these are non-fiction texts that give facts and information about a topic. These academic texts are common in subjects such as science, history, and social sciences. Now let's go to question number 38. Which of the following is not an aim of linguistics? A, study the nature of language. B, establish a theory of language. C, make up stories of the origin of language. Letter D, describe a language and all languages. Again, which, is, which, among, of the, which among the following is not an aim of linguistics? A, study the nature of language. B, establish a theory of language. C, make up stories of the origin of language. And letter D, describe a language and all languages. Okay, the correct answer is letter C. Make up stories of the origin of language, not an aim of linguistics. To make up stories means to invent imaginary stories about the origin of language. And that is not to invent or make up stories about the origin of language. That's not one of the aims of linguistics. Of course, linguistics, um, one of the aims is to study the nature of language, to establish a theory of language, and to describe a language. 39, prediction, questioning, Seeking clarification and summarizing are all components of which technique? A. Directed reading thinking activity or DRTA. B. Direct, directed listening thinking activity. C. Reciprocal teaching. D. Directed reading activity. Again, prediction, questioning, seeking clarification, and summarizing are all components of which technique? A, directed reading thinking activity. Letter B, directed listening thinking activity. Letter C, reciprocal teaching. And letter D, directed reading activity. Okay, the correct answer is letter C, reciprocal teaching. 
Reciprocal teaching is an instructional activity that takes the form of a dialogue between teachers and students regarding segments of text for the purpose of constructing the meaning of text. Reciprocal teaching is used in small groups across the curriculum. Number 40, according to Jose Garcia Villa in his Lyric 17, first, a poem must be A, historical, B, sentimental, C, vocal, D, magical. Again, according to Jose Garcia Villa in his Lyric 17, First, a poem must be A, historical, B, sentimental, C, vocal, B, magical. Okay, the correct answer is magical. According to Jose Garcia Villa in his Lyric 17, first, a poem must be magical. Here, first, a poem must be magical, then musical as a seagull. It must be a brightness moving and hold secret a bird's flowering. It must be slender as a bell and it must hold fire as well. So first, according to Jose Garcia Villa, a poem must be magical. Okay, number 41. Jeff is teaching science students how to discuss environmental Issues such as who is to blame for pollution. To ensure their success, Jeff should teach his students the organizational pattern of A. Description B. Cause and effect C. Sequencing D. Problem and solution. Again, Jeff is teaching science students how to discuss environmental issues such as who is to blame for pollution. To ensure their success, Jeff should teach his students the organizational pattern of A. Description B. Cause and effect C. Sequencing D. Problem and solution Okay, the correct answer is letter B. Cause and effect Okay? To ensure their success, Jeff should teach his students the organizational pattern of cause and effect. First, what is an organizational pattern? It is a process that assists in structuring and organizing your ideas, thoughts, speech, as well as a presentation for optimal impact. Here, the topic in, in the question is the environment, such as pollution, right? Here, it says, Jeff is teaching science students how to discuss environmental issues, such as who is to blame for pollution. So, cause and effect. Here, you will ask, uh, Jeff will ask his students, what are the causes of pollution? Effect. What are the effects of pollution? So the appropriate organizational pattern here is cause and effect. <clears throat> cause and effect. This pattern is used to show the different causes and effects of various conditions. Paragraphs structured as cause and effect explains reasons why something happened or the effects of something. The clue words are for this reason, consequently, because of that account, as a result, therefore, however. Cause and effect pattern. Now let's go to question number 42. It refers to our ability to understand words, sentences, and texts. A. Language comprehension. B. Textual analysis. C. Linguistic competence. B. Reading facility. Again, it refers 
to our ability to understand words, sentences, and texts. A, language comprehension. B, textual analysis. C, linguistic competence. D, reading facility. Okay, the correct answer is language comprehension. Our ability to understand words, sentences, and texts. Language comprehension is an overarching term used to describe a student's ability to derive meaning from written and oral language. So, language comprehension. Three components of language comprehension include vocabulary knowledge, background knowledge, and knowledge of text and sentence structures. Again, the three components of language comprehension include vocabulary knowledge, background knowledge, and knowledge of text and sentence structures. Language comprehension is one of the most automatic tasks that humans perform, yet it is also one of the most complex, requiring the simultaneous integration of many different types of information, such as knowledge about letters and their sounds, spelling, grammar, word meanings, and general world knowledge. In addition, general cognitive abilities such as attention monitoring, inferencing, and memory retrieval are used in order to organize this information into a single meaningful representation. So that's the concept of language comprehension. Now let's go to question number 43. When two consonants together create one sound that is different from either individual sound, this is known as A, a blend, B, a digraph, C, a controlled blend, D, schwa. Again, when two consonants together create one sound that is different from either individual sound, this is known as A, blend, B, digraph, C, controlled blend, Larry D. Schwa. The correct answer is digraph. Digraph. First, let's discuss schwa. Schwa is called the lazy man's um, vowel. Here, the syllable is unstressed. Schwa. Unstressed. That's why it's called lazy man's vowel. Digraph. The prefix di means two. Right? The question says, when two consonants together create one sound. So di means two. That is your in. For you to be able to get the correct answer. The prefix di means two. Digraph is a combination of two letters representing one sound, as in PH in the Philippines, right? PH, two letters, one sound. Philippines. Consonant digraphs are combinations such as PH, as in this, WH, as in when, SH, as in shine, and CH, as in church. Digraphs. Now let's go to question number. 44. What literary device is usually present in tongue twisters? A. Simile. B. Assonance. C. Alliteration. D. Synecdoche. Again, what literary device is usually present in tongue twisters? A. Simile. B. Assonance. C. Alliteration. D. Synecdoche. Okay, the correct answer is letter C, alliteration. What literary device is usually present in tongue twisters? It's alliteration. It is the repetition 
of initial consonant sound in two or more neighboring words or syllables. Alliteration, the repetition of initial consonant sound in two or more neighboring words or syllables. So here, here is a, a very famous tongue twister, Peter Piper. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. A peck of pickled peppers, Peter Piper picked. If Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, what are the pickled peppers Peter Piper picked? So there is the repetition here of the, of the consonant sound P, right? P. So this is alliteration. Now let's go to question number 45. The advent of the printing press in Europe in 1455 was important because A, it showed that Europeans had finally caught up with Chinese printing technology skills. B, it opened a trade route between Europe and China that was used for many other goods. C, it helped disseminate religious and other texts much more easily and help play a role in the Renaissance. And letter D, it made books easier to carry than when they were written as scrolls. Again, the advent of the printing press in Europe in 1455 was important because A, it showed that Europeans had finally caught up with Chinese printing technology skills. Letter B, it opened a trade route between Europe and China that was used for many other goods, C, it helped disseminate religious and other texts much more easily and helped play a role in the Renaissance. And letter D, it made books easier to carry than when, than when they were written as scrolls. Okay, the correct answer is letter C. It helped disseminate religious and other texts much more easily and helped play a role in the Renaissance. The advent of the printing press in Europe in 1455 was important because it helped disseminate religious and other texts much more easily and helped play a role in the Renaissance. Although movable type printing press as well as paper first appeared in China, it was in Europe that printing first became mechanized. So life after the printing press, literacy with a higher literacy rate came different views on reading. There was, in, there was an increase of novels and larger readings and people could discuss the ideas they read about at home. Now let's go to number 46. Nick Joaquin's short story, May Day Eve, uses the theme of A, magic realism, B, collective nationalism, C, cultural sensitivity, and letter D, modern romanticism. Again, Nick Joaquin's short story, May Day Eve, uses the theme of A, magic Realism, B, collective nationalism, C, cultural sensitivity, and letter D, modern romanticism. Okay, the correct answer is letter A, magic realism. So Nick Watkins May Day Eve uses the theme of magic realism first. May Day Eve is one of Nick Joaquin's signature stories. It became a classic in Philippine literature in English. It's about the story of Doña Agida and Don Badoy Montilla, as well as the effect of a superstitious belief in their lives. So what is magical realism or magic realism? 
magical realism is a genre of literature that depicts the real world as having an undercurrent of magic or fantasy. Magical realism is a part of the realism genre of fiction. Within a work of magical realism, the world is still grounded in the real world, but fantastical elements are considered normal in this world, like fairy tales, magical realism novels, and short stories blur the line between fantasy and reality. And this started in Latin American countries and spread across the globe. So magical, that is the concept of magical realism. Now let's go to question number 47. Which of the following or which of these is not true of the sorceress Medea? A, she used her magic to help Jason obtain the golden fleece. Letter B, she gained her powers by killing her aunt Circe. Letter C, her grandfather was the sun god Helios, and Laridi, she killed two of her own children when Jason spurned her. Again, which of these is not true of the sorceress Medea? She used her magic to help Jason obtain the golden fleece. Laridi, she gained her powers by killing her aunt Circe. Laridi, her grandfather was the sun god Helios, and Laridi, she killed two of her own children when Jason spurned her. Okay, the correct answer is letter B. She gained her powers by killing her aunt Circe. Not true of the sorceress Medea. You know, in Greek mythology, the sorceress, in Greek mythology, they are beautiful women they are pretty women and medea is one of them right she used yes she used her magic to help jason obtain the golden fleece you can remember the story of the quest of the golden fleece yes her grandfather was the son of helios in other references oh it is said that not her grandfather, but her father. Helios was her father. In other references, her grandfather. And she killed two of her own children when Jason spurned her. So, which is not true. She gained her powers by killing her aunt, Circe. So Medea is in Greek mythology is an enchantress who helped Jason, leader of the Argonauts, to obtain the golden fleece. Number 48. Who among the following translated Homer? A. Thomas Gray. B. Samuel Johnson. C. Oliver Goldsmith. B. Alexander Pope. Again. Who among the following translated Homer? A. Thomas Gray, B. Samuel Johnson, C. Oliver Goldsmith, B. Alexander Pope. Okay, the correct answer is Alexander Pope. Homer was or is the presumed author of the Iliad and the Odyssey. He is one of the most influential authors of all time. Alexander Pope, on the other hand, was an English poet and satirist, the acknowledged master of the heroic couplet, and one of the primary make uh, one of the primary taste makers of the Augustan age. Alexander Pope translated the poems of Homer into heroic couplets, which are a type of meter conventionally used for epic and narrative poetry. So who among the following translated Homer? It's Alexander Pope. Number 49. The application letter is a, a summary of your qualifications and experiences. Be a foreword, 
see a description of your core strengths and suitability for the job. And letter D, a statement of your job objective. Again, the application letter is A, a summary of your qualifications and experiences. B, a forward. C, a description of your core strengths and suitability for the job. And letter D, a statement of your job objective. The correct answer is letter C, a description of your core strengths and suitability for the job. Here, in, the applica in your application letter, you tell your prospective employer why he or she should hire you. Hence, you advertise your core strengths and suitability for the job. It means you are the one they are looking for. Suitability for the job. And number 50, this is the last number. It involves learning a language that is spoken in the surrounding community. A, English as a foreign language. B, English as a second language. C, English as a first language. Letter D, English for speakers of other languages. The correct answer is letter B, English as a second language it involves learning a language that is spoken in the surrounding community. That's English as a second language. That's ESL. And our situation here in the Philippines is that we are an ESL country. English as a second language. Because although it's not our first language, English is widely spoken here. We are not an EFL country. In EFL is English as a foreign language. If you study English in China, then English there is a foreign language, not a second language. So thank you for listening and see you in the next final coaching session. Good day, everyone.